Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. The cultural history of, of uh, Czech lands is associated so much with the ecclesial authorities trying to convince people by using strong dogmatic statements. Mm. There is a almost an inborn skepticism in people's minds towards any sort of dogmatic presentation of faith. But the way Lewis and Tolkien present the faith is, is so different. It's not confrontative. It's just trying to invite the reader to enjoy the vision mm-hmm. which is yeah which is exactly uh, what uh, fits the cultural context in the Czech Republic well, we're here today with professor Pavel Hoshek who has a PhD in theology and religion having done his dissertation on CS Lewis what is very exciting is is that Pavel is part of the Protestant theological faculty at Charles University in in Prague. So thank you so much for joining us today, Pavel. Thank you for the invitation. And my first question for you is, how did you get interested in C.S. Lewis living in the Czech Republic? I didn't know who C.S. Lewis is. Uh, Shortly after I became a Christian, a friend of mine suggested that I would try to read uh, the first volume of the Narnia Chronicles. And I had no idea uh, who C.S. Lewis was. And uh, my experience um, during the time of reading uh, the Narnia Chronicles and also the Great Divorce was so powerful that I decided to um, trace um, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, to follow all the um, information I could get. And um, at that time, which was early 90s, um, C.S. Lewis books Gra- um, gradually were translated and published in Czech language. So um, there was a growing uh, set of Louis books uh, available on the Czech uh, market. And I, I just got excited and uh, fell in love with Louis. I wanted to follow up on the question about becoming a Christian. The Czech Republic is known to have a very high percentage of, of uh, non-believers of any sort, uh, only maybe... 10 or 12% of Christians. How did you become a Christian in a country where that's not that common? I was not raised in a Christian family, and um, you are right. Uh, The Czech Republic is probably the most secular country in Europe um, for many and very complex historic reasons. Uh, It's not just because uh, we had this four decades of communist uh, government, it actually has its roots deeper in, in Czech culture and political history. But but as a matter of fact, uh, Czech society is very secular. And so it was um, uh, some friends of mine who, as I realized, uh, were believers who sort of uh, introduced Christianity to me. I really didn't know hmm. anything about the Bible and about Christ and about uh, what Christians believe. So it was on the basis of friendship and also some recommended reading that I um, got into first contact with uh, with the Christian message. And since um, I was also at that time, I was 19, um, so it was a period of spiritual seeking or search in, in my own life. Um, I found a very convincing resonance between um, the thirst or hunger in my heart and what I uh, read in the Gospels. So uh, I was inspired and um, excited, in fact, by how exactly the Gospel seemed to respond to my existential condition. Mm -hmm. And and so that was the time of my conversion Mm -hmm. at, at the age of 19. Wow. And was this, did, did you say the early 90s? Because I know with, with the fall of communism, there was, for a while, there was much more open to things from the West, things from around the globe. And so it seems like that was a good time to be planting the seed in Eastern Europe. Uh, we had a, a Russian scholar here who I believe you know, Olga Lukmanovna, and she said there was a real opening there with the fall of communism for uh, Christian evangelism. InterVarsity went into uh, Eastern Europe. So I wonder if that, did anything similar happen in the Czech Republic? Yes, definitely. There was a great openness to 
um, anything spiritual, really. So mm. it was a time um, of uh, much openness to the Christian gospel, but also, and even more so, I would say, people were really interested because of having been spiritually hungry for 40 years, many people mm. were more interested in, in neo-paganism and new age and and some Eastern religions. So, so it was kind of chaotic because we were really searching spiritually, but we had very limited guidance and very little wisdom in terms of how to discern. So those who been fortunate like myself of having close Christian friends um, to guide us through this mm. confusing mm. and exciting, but but also chaotic period, um, eventually um, um, got into contact with with the gospel. Mm. Well, it's ironic you mentioned Eastern religions, and according to that esteemed resource Wikipedia, uh, the Czech Republic is third only in the number of declared atheists. It's third only to China and Japan. So it seems ironic mm. that people would uh, be seeking Eastern religions that in some cases have a higher percentage of atheists than the Czech Republic. Excuse hmm. me, Crystal. Hmm. Well, I want to hear what part C.S. Lewis played in the the uh, advancing of your understanding of faith. Do you remember what it was about his writing that captured you? Yes, actually, uh, my experience with C.S. Lewis was almost kind of a second conversion. Huh. Because after I became a Christian, because of this deep existential search, um, I was not a particularly happy Christian. Uh, mm. There was something uh, more serious and perhaps even sad about my mm. Christianity. I mean, I, I believed I found the truth, but I was not that excited about um, its beauty, I would say. Mm. And... Mm. All of a sudden, reading C.S. Lewis, I felt like the faith I had already accepted has this glorious dimension, this this this, this uh, dimension of beauty, which I didn't know about. I, I was not aware about that, and it was very appealing to me because it was almost as if part of my soul, which had no nourishment till that time found its um, source of life in, in this aspect of Christianity, which I was not familiar with. In other words, I mean, on the rational basis, in terms of the truth claims of, of Christian faith, I, I already was a Christian, but there was this emotional an imaginative aspect of my personality. I was kind of alienated from it. And Lewis was a very intelligent, educated intellectual, but at the same time, this poetic dimension to his writing, this imaginative appeal was very important, significant for me. It was almost a healing process that Lewis started, like reconciling the the mind and the heart or, or, or my brain with, with my emotions. And I have observed something very similar um, with many of my friends. Some of them actually were brought to, to faith through reading C.S. Lewis, but others like myself first became, a Christ, first became Christians and then um, uh, experienced something very significant in this, in this holistic understanding of Christianity, which C.S. Lewis expresses in his books, which nourishes both the mind and, and the heart as well. I think that's true of many Americans as well. I grew up in a church that was upright, but rather a joyless expression of faith. And Lewis loved to talk about the beauty of holiness. And he also mm -hmm. said, joy is the serious business of heaven. And I think that joyfulness and that sense of the aesthetic beauty of the Christian faith really comes through in Lewis the way you don't get it in a lot of other Christian writers. I had a very similar experience uh, being from a church background here in the U.S. I read an article of yours online about how even though the Czech Republic has a lot of atheists and a lot of people who aren't interested in religion, yet Lewis is read and people appreciate him. Now, are they reading him in English or in Czech? They read him in Czech because since there is such a high degree of interest, most of uh, Louis' books have been translated and published in Czech relatively 
um, um, soon after the fall of the communist regime. So a number of uh, Lewis books have gone through three, four, five editions since that time. Hmm. Wow. Um, because there is such a large readership, which is much larger than the Christian community, because Czechs do not respond very much to abstract rational arguments about religion, but they do respond to beauty. Mm-hmm. They, they, they mm-hmm. do respond to poetry. And, and this is something uh, that makes C.S. Lewis uh, a particularly well-fitted author for the Czech mindset, for the Czech soul. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people in our country um, respond positively to Narnia Chronicles and, and to Cosmic Trilogy and Until We Have Faces. And, and so it is, in most cases, the imaginative writings of C.S. Lewis that people sort of read first and only later would they also read books like Mere Christianity and Problem of Pain mm-hmm. and those, or essays, those with more like rational arguments and, and, and more uh, conceptual content. Um, and uh, since Lewis' writings is so diverse and each and every person can just choose whatever appeals best right. to, to where he or she is, it, it, it really works quite well. And, and because the Narnia Chronicles have really become part of mainstream culture, and so most people um, in our country know Lewis now wow. as the author of, of that um, glorious series yeah. for children. Um, those Christians who work with C.S. Lewis do not have to introduce him to their mm. non-believing friends. They already know him. It's kind mm. of like with Tolkien. I mean, he's already there, um, known and appreciated and loved by most people in the country. So it is more about the spiritual um, um, dimension hmm. of Lewis and Tolkien's work that that um, like opens a con- conversation between a Christian and a non-believer in our country very often. Well, both of those authors are actually selling more now, p- perhaps because of the movies, than they did in the 70s and 80s. Mere Christianity is selling as many copies in China now as it did in England in its first decade when it was published. So they're definitely becoming international figures. Uh, Tell us about your books on C.S. Lewis. What were you trying to accomplish in your publications? These are in Czech? Yes. Uh, I won't have you read a passage for our our (laughs) listeners. Well, uh, the sound of the Czech language is very charming, but I won't um, (laughs) speak in Czech now. Um, Definitely. Um, uh, I wrote my first book um, uh, basically as, as a reworking of my doctoral dissertation. So it started as an academic um, paper, really, uh, focusing on uh, Lewis' understanding of imagination and also on the cooperation or balance or harmony between reason and imagination mm-hmm. in uh, Lewis' anthropology and how, it, how he actually applies what he thinks in the way he writes. Mm -hmm. So that was generally the the theme of my first book on Lewis. And I was actually doing the research here at Wade Center. It was was in 2001. So it's Mm. long ago. And um, we should have some sound effect every time one of our interviewees mentions the Wade Center. Yeah. Shouldn't we have like a ding? <laughs> drop the duck, they used to say on, on Groucho Marx. Excuse me for interrupting, but I'm well, so glad to hear that you benefited yes, from our benefited. resources here. <laughs> well, I mean, it. Uh, I, I have to say I, I have very, very strong and, 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 and um, blessed mem- memories of that time. It was actually, I think it was the year when the Wade Center was being moved from Boswell Library to right. this right. new building and yeah and Chris Mitchell was so um, um so helpful and 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 he really guided me through the collection and it was such a help and of course bringing all the wealth on, of information and scholarship which I was able to find here um to the Czech Republic where few people knew more about C.S. Lewis than whatever they could read on mm-hmm. the back um, a page of the books uh, was really something um, something enriching not just for me but for Czech educated public as well. My second uh, book on uh, Lewis was actually focusing on his understanding of story 
and the transforming power of story. I basically mm-hmm. used uh, the phrase about baptizing imagination, oh, right. mm-hmm. uh, which he uses when he speaks about his experience with George MacDonald. And uh, I used that phrase in the title and I did my research uh, here um, at well, Wade Center. Give us the title and check. I'd like to hear the title of the book and check. Um, the, uh, the, the first book, uh, is entitled C.S. Lewis Mitus Imaginace a Pravda. And the second is Kouzlo vyprávění proměňující moc příběhu a křest imaginace v pojetí C.S. Luise. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Elvish, I know. Yeah, But I, know. <laughs> I, think we could, I think we could gained a few Pentecostal listeners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Translate that yeah. second title yeah. for us. Yeah, the, the, it, it basically means the um, um, charm of storytelling with with a long subtitle, uh, basically referring to the, basically um, expressing the idea of the transforming power of story and the baptism of imagination as C.S. Lewis understood it. I thought I heard the word pravda at the end of that first title. Yeah, true. That means truth in Russian, yeah. right? Is this That's cognate with the Russian word truth? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Russian and Czech are actually quite close, both Slavic or Slavonic languages. Mm. So the script is different because uh, Russian language uses different alphabet, but Czechs listening to Russian understand 60, 70% huh. mm. because it's it's really close in, in terms of most roots for like Pravda is Pravda. Yeah. Right. It's a good example mm. of how close those languages are. Mm. Yeah. When we were talking to this scholar who teaches in Russia, she was saying that when the Narnia stories were first read in after the fall um, of the Soviet Union, that people were interpreting the thawing of Narnia when the witch had frozen everything and then Aslan breathes and the um, frozen ice melts. They interpreted that as the thawing that came with the fall of the Soviet Union. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, no, to be, oh. to be honest, I, I, I didn't know about this interesting interpretation, which would give Narnia Chronicles a prophetic <laughs> dimension, wouldn't it? Um, since yes. they were written decades before right. uh, what was happening. But yeah, but definitely in, in our country, as in many other communist countries, um, um, those who knew at least some of uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien writings would tend to interpret them as, you know, political allegories, really. Um, mm-hmm. Especially Tolkien was was very often actually interpreted um, as portraying the political misery of a totalitarian communist regime. I mean, uh-huh. the interpretation didn't didn't really um, imply that this is what what, what, what talking intended. meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It was it was rather viewed as a very appropriate application, mm-hmm. as he would say, not, mm-hmm. not an allegory. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is ironic because Tolkien denounced the al- allegorical elements in C.S. Lewis, but he is so often, his Lord of the Rings is interpreted allegorically. I was just reading a letter from Dorothy Sayers to C.S. Lewis, and she was talking about how after the Fellowship of the Ring was published, all these people were interpreting the ring as representing atomic power. Because, of course, this was the early 50s, and people are still worried. They're building bomb shelters, worrying about the implications of the atomic bomb. And to have someone who himself valued subcreation and denounced allegory to be so often allegorized is somewhat humorous. That's true. He did leave room for what you called a minute ago, applicability. Yeah. He didn't like allegory because the, the writer is imposing meanings upon the reader, whereas applicability, the reader is free to find applications. So I think that that's a good distinction on his part. Can- yeah. And uh, I mean, in the conversation about the possible meanings of the Lord of the Rings, um, uh, Tolkien would allow space for not him trying to allegorize historical situation, but this historical situation becoming similar 
right. to his literary work, which is exactly what was happening. I mean, mm. the, the communist world was becoming very much like Mordor mm-hmm. uh, because of some of the principles that were uh, operating in, in, in that sort of totalitarian regime. Yeah. So uh, the communist authorities actually would ban Tolkien for, wow. for that. I, I, mm. I mean, it was mm. impossible to publish him um, officially because they basically also <laughs> read um, The Lord of the Rings as an allegory of themselves, which is uh, wow. kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I've heard people go so far as to say that Gondor is England. The writers of Rowan, they stay out of the war for a long time and they eventually come to the rescue. And the Brits were really waiting for America to get involved in World War II. He's writing this in World War II. And people think unconsciously this sense of why why aren't the writers of Rowan coming to help us? That unconsciously is thinking, why aren't the Americans getting involved in, in this war? And I've heard that uh, Sauron is Hitler and Saruman is Stalin. And they're really, and that's the kind of thing that would make him very uncomfortable, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But he was writing in that atmosphere, totalitarianism was so dominant when he's writing. So I think it would be almost unconsciously he would think of evil in terms of this incredible political oppression and dominance yeah. and willingness to invade other countries. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but, he's embedded in this particular historical moment that can't help but influence how he imagines good and evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of the ba- being banned and somebody gets a hold of the book and they go, well, this is a hobbit with hairy feet. <laughs> they enjoy smoking pipe weed. I don't quite get what's so subversive here. Mm. But as you continue reading, now you're working on a Tolkien book right now. Is that correct? Yeah. And do you yeah. have a particular focus or something that you want to get across to your audience? Yeah, I, I'm actually focusing on the spiritual um, dimension or elements in Lord of the Rings, um, because there is a very interesting, fascinating debate among. Tolkien scholars, particularly those who have some theological training, uh, debating, discussing how Tolkien's Christian Roman Catholic faith is mirrored or reflected or expressed or represented in his literary work. Mm -hmm. And it is so interesting that even the ways of framing this question are so numerous. How actually should this Christian element or Christian inspiration of Tolkien's art be communicated so that the reader, if he or she is interested, knows about that, about what was nourishing Tolkien's imagination, but at the same time, so that it does not eventually become a Christian allegory, which he didn't intend uh, to write. So... In the Czech situation, where so many people know and love Tolkien, and so few are even aware of his um, deep Christian piety and spirituality, mm-hmm. it's something worth communicating. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he would, I'm sure, not be happy if the Lord of the Rings is used as an evangelistic instrument in a direct sense because that would almost then suggest that it is it is a christian right. allegory right. so it is it is somehow very interesting mysterious and and yeah i would just like to sort of um interpret carefully and um with sensitivity to what Tolkien himself says about how he understands his work how should we think about and how should we understand the spiritual dimension of mm-hmm. his art mm-hmm. and of his imagination? Right. And there was some tension between Lewis and Tolkien over this matter. Lewis said things like, after he wrote the Ransom Trilogy, he says, I think it's possible to smuggle any amount of theology into readers' minds under the guise of romance without their knowing it. And of the Narnia Chronicles, he said, so many children have these stale Sunday school uh, associations of the faith. And I want to sneak past those watchful dragons, watchful dragons. and appeal to... But uh, Tolkien wouldn't have said either one of those no. things. Because no. they're very much, I'm writing this to have a particular effect on the reader. Uh. But there are kind of uh, Easter eggs. The uh, When people call for Elbereth Gathaniel, 
That's, uh, she's the queen of heaven among the pantheon. If you read Cimmerillion, you get more background on it's kind of the imaginary theology. He does have Luvatar, the, the all-father, who creates these, what we would think of maybe as archangels, but they're gods and goddesses. But when uh, Frodo is being attacked by the ringwraiths, he shouts, Elbereth Gathaniel, and then he tries to stab the, the head king, head of the ringwraiths, uh, and he just gets his cloak. And later, Aragorn says, well, you didn't do any good with your knife, but it probably did better when you said Elbereth Gathaniel. Mm-hmm. And when you think about that, that's something, it's very implicit and latent, but he seems to be implying that calling on Elbereth, who's kind of a queen of heaven figure, almost a, a Mary figure. Um, so yeah, you'll have fun with this. There's a lot of little Easter eggs in, in the story there. Absolutely. And what is really fascinating to is to read uh, Tolkien's uh, responses to his readers um, in the published letters, right. because so many readers are asking these sorts of questions. Right. And he always responds in a way that is kind of affirmative mm-hmm. concerning the spiritual religious element in the Lord of the Rings. But at the same time, he, he always tries to make it, make it clear that it is not really trying to preach, or he is not having any didactic um, um, yeah. goal right. when, when he was writing. It, it, it's kind of more gentle, and, and, and he, he really, I think he wants to grant more freedom to the reader and let the work operate on the reader, right. rather than sort of telling him or her what, mm-hmm. what to, how to understand and how to interpret. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But sometimes he does surprise you. One reader said, the limbus bread, they carry this bread and it's so invigorating and renews the, the soul as well as the body. Is that something like the elements of the Eucharist? And he agreed that there was an element to that. I expected him to reject that kind of symbolic or allegorical interpretation, but he was open to that possibility. That yeah, but, but what is very interesting is how careful his wording is in it, this right, particular letter because he says, uh, after quoting this this interpretation and identification between Lembas and the Eucharist, he says, oh, great things might be coloring the author's imagination when he is talking about lesser or smaller things. So he is, mm. he's kind of saying yes, but in a very, very gentle and very careful way. To, mm. to this suggestion that, that there is this symbolism going on. Right, Just like right. with, with identifying Albereth or, or Galadriel with, with the Virgin Mary. He, he says yes, but, but, but that's, that's not exactly um, in the sense of you know, trying to preach our, right, a theological right. lesson through the, the figure of Galadriel. Mm. Yeah. I think in some ways it's unconscious. Um, I was reading a lot of the mythology behind Dragon Slayers and the Ring. A lot of this comes out of Germanic lore. And even if you read uh, Wagner's Ring Cycle, the storyline, you have a helmet of invisibility and you have Dragon Slayers. <coughs> Excuse me. And Odin is kind of a Gandalf figure. But um, it's a very amoral universe, the, the world of European mythology. And I don't know if it's conscious or not, but he has such a strong sense of what good people look like. You know, Aragorn is really a good man as well as a good king. Uh, Gandalf and even Frodo, his willingness to sacrifice when he really doesn't have the kind of resources as uh, people like Aragorn and Gandalf. And so it's not didactic, but it's very powerful. To I've seen some bumper stickers lately that said Aragorn for president. And <laughs> even though it's humorous, yes, there's goodness. kind of a, a vacuum there of people saying this is the kind of person we wish was available for leadership in our country. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And um, just as he says about the author of Beowulf, uh, he himself portrayed the pre-Christian world in ways that really emphasized the noble and, and, and good um, qualities in, in, in the positive heroes of the story, whereas he had no um, romantic illusions about real paganism. I mean, he is quite realistic about right, about right. the dark side of uh, paganism in, in in some of his letters. So, so he was basically um, expressing um, ideals which were nourished by his Christian uh, right, faith. Right. No question about that. But I think for the Czech mindset, for um, 
for a mentality which is which is quite reluctant to um, accept any sort of direct religious um, proclamation, mm. but which is responding to beauty and poetry. Tolkien's way of communication is a perfect fit. Mm. I, I, mm. I think exactly his implicitness is is the key to to a chick heart i mean that mm. that that's wow. exactly what works mm. in that kind of culture mm. yeah. well you teach at the preeminent university in the czech republic charles university are you able to teach tolkien and lewis at the university yes yes uh i just finished uh, a semester um of uh, a seminar on tolkien um, and uh, it's about every third uh, academic year that I offer a course either on C.S. Lewis or on Tolkien, and the students love them both. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it brings me a lot of joy to, um, to offer these courses because it's, it's always fun when mm -hmm. students enjoy the theme. Right, right. So, Do yeah. you ever run into resistance to their theological assumptions among your students no mm. no even those students who may not agree with some of those theological convictions are curious to know and interested in understanding uh what was the um conceptual framework and the set of convictions of both uh, lewis and tolkien mm. i mean not not always would they accept whatever Tolkien and, and Lewis believed, but it's, it's definitely a matter of interest. Mm -hmm. And the emotional <laughs> um, battle is won already because they already love them, you know? Right. So, so then it kind of makes things easier. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. that's what we love about being here at the Wade Center because we have people who will visit us who don't have interest in Christianity but they're fascinated by Tolkien or Lewis. And so it is an opportunity for these great conversations. And it goes back to what you were talking about that sounds like it was the subject of your dissertation. It's about the power of imagination, that you can break through certain theological analytic resistance by way of the imagination. Yeah, because it, it really is... I think the power of this imaginative appeal is that it really um, um, mediates experience. The, the reader actually experiences or tastes or touches something that he or she may not approve of intellectually, conceptually, but it's kind of like what C.S. Lewis said about, about his experience when he was basically in his late teenage mm -hmm. with reading Fantasties by mm -hmm. uh, George MacDonald. He says he did not agree with his will and with his reason, mm -hmm. but that day his imagination was right. baptized. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there is a sense of getting initiated through the experience of the reader and 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 maybe years later, and it was years later in 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 the case of C.S. Lewis, um, the reason and the will um, sort of agree eventually with right. the imagination. Right. Right. He has yeah. a passage in Screw Tape Letters where he talks about the medieval model of the human personality, and he sees that it's concentric circles with will in the middle, and then I mean in the center, and then surrounding that is the intellect, and then the outer circle is imagination. So he said something enters your imagination, such as Christianity did through George MacDonald when he was a teenager. But it wasn't until his late 20s when he was talking to Tolkien about the dying God myths that his intellect was beginning to see something really plausible and compelling about Christianity's worldview. But the hardest step for him, he called himself the most reluctant convert, because to actually surrender to a person and to realize that your life is not your own, that's a much bigger step than intellectual affirmation. So I yeah. think that model it fits his own spiritual journey very closely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have Catholic colleagues who are more excited about Tolkien? Sometimes among Americans, evangelicals tend to go immediately to Lewis, and Roman Catholics 
are, a lot of the scholarship in America about Tolkien is by the uh, Roman Catholic scholars. Is there anything like that go on in, in the Czech Republic? Well, uh, a number of my Roman Catholic friends um, really like Tolkien and really like the fact that he was a devout Roman Catholic. And, and, and that is um, uh, an, an, an extra factor for interest on the side of many Roman Catholics because he also, I mean, in one sense, being a cultural hero <laughs> and a very um, admired writer um, makes my Roman Catholic friends happy that He's one of mm. the one of them, <laughs> one of the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so, so it's kind of, um, um, yeah, uh, a, a definitely positive um, uh, uh, factor that adds to the imaginative experience with just reading Tolkien. Uh, but I, I think what is what is actually quite positive about the situation in in the Czech Republic being so secular is that uh, Christians of any background feel that um, the things that differentiate the confessional alternatives of Christianity are not so important. In other words, mm. Roman Catholics, evangelicals, mainstream, mainstream Protestants feel to be part of one family right. because th there is no Christian group that would be in the position of cultural mainstream or dominance. And it mm. brings Christians more closer to each other. So there is much ecumenical sharing in appreciation uh, of both Tolkien and Lewis. A friend of mine, uh, a young lady, uh, finished her uh, PhD on C.S. Lewis, and she's a Roman Catholic, and she did it at the Catholic Theological Faculty of the Charles University last mm. year. So yeah, she's one of those Catholics who really like uh, and and appreciate uh, Lewis as many others, and yeah. So I think um, probably more evangelicals um, are excited about Lewis, and more Catholics are excited about Tolkien. But I, I think generally speaking, it's it's kind of um, um, it's not a divisive issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it sounds like there isn't really an Orthodox presence in the Czech Republic. We hear that Eastern Orthodox really like C.S. Lewis, uh, but I know there's a strong Orthodox Church in Russia and Catholic, I mean, in Poland, it's very strongly uh, a Catholic presence, but it sounds like Czech Republic doesn't have uh, an Orthodox uh, tradition. Uh, actually, the uh, Orthodox Church is among the um, uh, small churches, and in fact, most uh, Orthodox Christians living in the Czech Republic are of Ukrainian or Russian background. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, um, even though um, many Slavic or Slavonic countries are Eastern Orthodox uh, in their majority, Czechs, Slovaks, and Poles are historically rather Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so the largest church in the Czech Republic is the Roman Catholic. But but even being largest, it is one million out of ten million. So it's ten percent of the entire population, which mm -hmm. which is which is a significant minority, but definitely a minority. Mm -hmm. Unlike Poland or Slovakia, where it would be seventy eighty percent uh, of Roman Catholic yeah. people. Uh, it, it, it's not a lot of historic ironies because the Moravians used to be a missionary church. You know, they had Moravian missionaries here in America. They come up in James Fenimore Cooper novels. They talk about the Moravians. Um, but that tradition is obviously pretty much declined since a few hundred years ago. Yes, that, that was actually um, an outcome of the so-called Czech Reformation, uh, um, a reformist movement started by John Huss, a reformist oh, right. yeah, right. preacher. And those uh, followers of John Huss and the Hussite, so-called Hussite movement, um, who formed the Moravian church, then had to leave the country because uh, during the Thirty Years' War uh, in the uh, 17th century, um, the Roman Catholic government was sort of strengthened and uh, kind of decided to to um, make all the inhabitants of the country either uh, become Roman Catholic or leave. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. this, is, this is one of the unhappy um, 
chapters in, in, in the cultural history of, of our country. So this is how Moravian brethren moved first to Germany. And from there, there was this huge missionary movement. But also um, the Roman Catholic, um, especially monks, um, had, it's interesting because the, 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 there are two branches of international missionaries coming from uh, from our country, from Central Europe, from the Czech lands. And these were Moravian brethren and Franciscan and Jesuit missionaries oh. who were the Roman Catholic version of, of overseas uh, cross-cultural mission. Similar, surprisingly, in some respects, right, but they right. have different parts of the spectrum. Yeah, I think nothing creates atheists more than Christians fighting with other Christians and oppressing mm -hmm. other Christians. It, it may explain some of the secularization in contemporary Rep Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's probably the main factor. The, the fact that um, Christians of different convictions were fighting against each other since basically the 15th century is probably one of the most um, secularizing factors in Czech cultural and political history. And, and that is probably what makes the Czech Republic the most secular country in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that makes you think of the importance of what Lewis is doing by offering mere Christianity. He exactly. He is trying to move us away from those antagonisms to look at what do we as Christians share. And I know both he and Dorothy Sayers, who I work on, uh, emphasize how do we go back and talk about our common footing in the, the creeds established by the first four ecumenical councils. Mm. Because after those first four, things start dividing between East and West, and you have the development of the filioque clause, things like that. That's right. And I, I think uh, C.S. Lewis is deservedly um, loved and appreciated across the ecumenical spectrum. There are many Roman Catholic and many evangelical and many mainstream Protestant readers and lovers of, of, of C.S. Lewis because he was ecumenical in that, mm -hmm. in that deep sense. And also, I think it is this healing factor of the appeal to imagination mm -hmm. I, I think it's 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 also somehow unifying mm -hmm. and healing the, the the gentle and kind way of presenting the beauty mm -hmm. of christianity mm -hmm. well because we tend to react to vocabularies that we aren't familiar with like like filioque <laughs> <laughs> uh but that was the brilliance of what Lewis did with Aslan, this, this figure who dies to save someone from the consequences of his choices, but then rises again. So the language doesn't interfere because it's a totally new vocabulary, and it's something that Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, uh, Protestant, and the numerous... Um, expressions of Protestantism can all agree about. This is the basis of mere Christianity, the death and resurrection of Christ, but it's represented by a lion. Yeah, yeah. And I think the extra power of what you just described is that even a secular reader, even an agnostic, who would probably not read a theological presentation of this truth, reading the witch, um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe actually experiences the quality and the mystery and reality of, of the, the plot of Christ's story without being um, sort of um, held back Right. By the stained glass associations, right? right. But we don't or hear the word propitiation or vocabulary or... words, right? So, um, you know, some people they'll hear the phrase "born again" and yeah. they'll just stop listening yeah. to you. And so, to insist on using "born again" if it's not working to draw people to Christ is a type of idolatry of vocabulary. Yeah, and and since the cultural history of, of uh, Czech lands actually is associated so much with uh, 
the ecclesial authorities trying to convince people by using strong dogmatic statements, mm. there is a almost an inborn um, skepticism mm. in people's mm. minds towards any sort of dogmatic presentation of faith. But the way Lewis and Tolkien present the faith mm. or the, the gospel is 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 um, so different, mm -hmm. and it's not confrontative. It's just trying to invite the reader to enjoy the vision, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, which is mm -hmm. exactly uh, what uh, fits the cultural context in the Czech Republic. Well, it goes back to, David, I think you recited that the famous line about sneaking past watchful dragons. The watchful dragons are these dragons saying, oop, you got to use this language or you're not an authentic Christian. But when you have the Eastern Church versus the Western Church versus the Protestant, they do use different language. And so then they are all reviling each other rather than saying, what do we share? Mm. Yeah. So exactly. Speaking of Aslan, I have to throw in this story, maybe end with the story of, uh, I had a student when I was teaching in Pennsylvania who read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and she said, Dr. Downing, I don't understand why people say this is Christian fantasy. What's Christian about it? And I said, well, Aslan dies for someone else's treachery and they're all brokenhearted because he's gone, but then he comes back from the dead and they're all joyful. Doesn't that ring a bell? And she said, oh, do you mean like Gandalf? Uh, so uh, I think there are a lot of different cultural milieu in which uh, Tolkien and Lewis can speak. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and blessings on this book on Tolkien and Per, I hope that it will speak to your uh, fellow citizens in the Czech Republic. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing here at Wade Center. It's it's such a help and such a blessing. And um, yeah, I have personally benefited so much from uh, oh, yeah. what the yeah, Wade Center you. is and has been. So thank you very much for your great work. Well, you've knocked off two of our authors. There's five more, so you need to keep <laughs> yeah, coming you back. Yeah, you have to keep coming right. back. <laughs> the Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave a review on iTunes and especially tell your friends. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, and our resources, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.